Joining us today is Daniel Moos, Chief Scientist, Geomechanics International, who will be speaking at IIR's CSG Drilling and Completions 2010 on the 23rd to 25th of June in Brisbane. Hello, Daniel. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, James. I appreciate the invitation. Firstly, can you provide a brief overview of the current status of uh, the CSG drilling sector in the U.S. at present? CSG is, I think, um, kind of a niche, marginal um, gas provider in the U.S. I don't think it provides more than 5 or 10% of the current production. Um, and a lot of it is in places like the San Juan Basin, uh, where the fairways are very productive, but uh, the outlying areas tend not to be. And in general, they drill um, horizontal wells and stimulate those or vertical wells and do what they call cavity completions. Um, and companies like BP and others, I think, are making a, a, you know, a profitable play out of, these, um, they, out of their assets. Um, and GMI, our, my company, has done some work on wellbore stability for them and also looking at solids production during exploitation. How can you exploit geomechanics to improve drilling and completion in CSG wells? Coals that are productive tend to be the ones that contain cleats or, or, or fractures, incipient fractures, and they tend to be fairly closely spaced. Um, coal itself, the matrix, is, is actually quite strong, um, but when you drill through a cleated formation, the, the cleats themselves are very weak. And... Um, Pressure oscillations in the drilling fluid um, and underweighted fluids tend to cause uh, hole stability problems. And so one of the things that your mechanics can do for you is it, is it can help you establish what the required mud weights are to drill safely in a given direction through the, through the resource. And it can also tell you, if you've already drilled successfully, say, a vertical well, it can tell you how much extra mud weight you might need in order to drill a horizontal well in a particular specified direction. So from the perspective of drilling, it, it can help you optimize wellbore stability so that you can safely reach the uh, objectives of your drilling program. And once you put the well onto production, the, the, the key elements are that you want to have sufficient permeability and you want to have sufficient stability of the well, and those tend to be competing requirements. Um, to get sufficient production, you'd like to have a long open hole connected to as much of the coal as you can. But when you do that, you intersect a lot of the cleats, and if you bring the well onto production too quickly, you can cause um, failure along those fracture planes and then, then leading to the production of solids or the collapse of the hole. And there's also this concept of a cavity completion, which involves essentially rapidly drawing down the well to create a zone which is sometimes referred to as a plastic zone around, around the well, which becomes more permeable but also shields the well from further instabilities. And um, we believe that the geomechanical explanation for why this sort of thing works is that what you're really doing is you're causing a little bit of slip along these fractures, and what that does is relieve the stresses, but the blocks themselves will still stay in the wall of the hole, and, and when you cause slip on these things, you produce excess permeability, which then allows you, essentially, to have a much larger wellbore into which you can flow the gas. Can you go into a bit more depth on how you mitigate the problem of rock instability caused by multiple cleat sets and bed boundary discontinuities? Well, if you, if you were to drill through one of these materials or attempt to do this cavity completion technology and you activate multiple planes, the blocks that you produce are typically small enough so that they can fall into the well and cause problems. But if you can uh, establish slip on only a subset of those planes, for example, you know, you can imagine there are three orthogonal planes. There's the, the bedding planes, and then the cleats tend to be perpendicular to bedding and perpendicular to each other. So if you, can only, if you only activate one of those planes, you're not really producing a fragment that can fall into the hole, but you are producing additional permeability, and that's a, that's a good thing. But if you cause failure along multiple planes, then, um, then you will produce blocks and they will fall into the hole, and that's a bad thing. And how can near-well transmissivity be increased by exploiting weak planes? By causing failure on the weak planes, um, you induce a little bit of slip, which 
tends to open them. They tend to be propped as a consequence. The permeability of the planes increases significantly, and you've created sort of a high permeability halo around the well so that you get fairly, you can get fairly large volumes of fluids transmitted to the well with relatively modest drawdowns. And that allows, um, first of all, it allows you to dewater the coals fairly efficiently without risking the generation of instability. And then once the coal is dewatered and you start to bring gas into the well, it allows fairly high flow rates of gas into the well with modest drawdowns. What lessons can the CSG industry in Australia learn from the U.S.? The coal gas industry in the U.S. benefits, I think, from the fact that most of the resources are in underpopulated areas. And so there's been an opportunity to try a lot of different technologies to achieve desired results. And so the ability to experiment in the U.S., I think, can, can provide benefits to the Australian industry where as I understand it, a lot of the resources are actually underneath populated areas, and you can't afford to experiment and pose a risk to the people living on top of your resource. So, on the one hand, the U.S. industry can be a, a kind of an incubator for new technologies, um, whereas the Australian industry can can act for the U.S. as um, a proving ground for what might be considered suboptimal but safer technologies. Um, so that in the U.S., if it turns out that these safer technologies actually deliver the kinds of productivities that the U.S. industry would like, then, then there's no reason not to employ them here in, in the United States. You are speaking at IIR CSG Drilling and Completions Conference 23rd to 25th of June in Brisbane. What will be the focus of your presentation? What I'm going to be focusing on um, is the application of geomechanical principles to understanding how to how best to drill and how best to optimally produce uh, gas from the wells that you've drilled. And primarily, the issues relate to how you would avoid um, excessively causing failure on multiple uh, creep sets. To avoid instabilities, and how you would, but how you would at the same time allow a certain amount of failure so that you get a, an optimal generation of, an, of a permeability ring surrounding the well. And one of the potential benefits um, that can be offered is the ability to establish situations in which you could drill the wells under balance. And that would serve multiple benefits, one of which would be that you would actually be producing resource while you're drilling, so you have a resource assessment while you're actually drilling well. And, and secondarily, if you produce under balance, it would accelerate um, bringing the resource online. And finally, what would you like delegates to take away with them from an event such as this? Well, I'd, I'd like there to be an appreciation of the role that geology, geophysics, and geomechanics can play in increasing the economic value of resources and a recognition that that there are certain constraints on on drilling or production. For example, it's not always possible if to drill from a single site horizontal wells in all orientations. Sometimes there is one orientation that is safer than the other. And so I'd like I'd like to stimulate an appreciation in the delegates of the fact that, that the stress state plays a role in how best to exploit the resource. Daniel Muse, thanks very much for your time. Okay, thank you, James.